Hello guys, this is Amol Khedkar. I welcome you to this video. Today I'm going to talk about the article that you see on your screen, which says Europe in 2030, four alternative futures. This will be a video in my ongoing series about the world in 2030 that I am doing on my YouTube channel. Uh, I have done many videos regarding different countries, so you can check all them out in uh, my YouTube channel. Uh, this will be a uh, video about Europe as a continent because Europe is also a part of the G20 countries. So, um, you know, I will go through uh, four alternative scenarios that can happen to Europe and which ones I think is the most probable. Okay. So before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel because I upload these kind of eye opening and detailed videos about world politics, uh, geopolitics, world economy and many other topics on a daily basis. You really don't want to miss out on any of this. Please don't forget to subscribe. So let's get started. So uh, this is a uh, Elcano policy paper. Okay. And so what they say is that there are possible four uh, futures for Europe in 2030. One is the failing Europe. Okay, like what it is right now. Okay, Europe is failing. Definitely. There's no doubt about that. Second is a strong and united European core. Okay, which says that, you know, uh, Europe will be like a very uh, big power on the world stage. Third is an Atlantic revival, Atlantic revival in the sense like, you know, even Europe and North America will both just dominate the entire world no matter what. And fourth is a strong China subverts the European order. Okay, so uh, I'll not go through very much details. I'll just, you know, uh, give you an idea about what exactly each of these talk about and then, you know, uh, uh, give you my analysis of all of them. Okay, so as you can see here, I hope you can read uh, the fine print here. Europe's future is not what it used to be. Definitely, it's not what it used to be. Ever since the global financial crisis broke out nearly a decade ago, Europe has been hit by one crisis after another. There has been a debt crisis, an economic crisis, an Arab Spring gone bad, a Ukraine conflict, a migration and refugee crisis, a subsequent wave of populism and nationalism running through much of Europe and a Brexit crisis. So definitely Europe has not had a very good uh, last 10 to 15 years. As you can see, uh, uh, they highlight many different bad things that have happened with Europe just in the past uh, 10, 15 years. Okay. And now there is a Trump crisis. <laughs> definitely now there is a trump crisis putting vital transatlantic ties into question okay granted the mood seems to have changed recently economic growth is back and the election of emmanuel macron as french president has brought a fresh energizing approach to discussions on the future of europe this could well create new political momentum to tackle some of the structural challenges faced by europe However, whether the new drive will lead to changes beyond the level of the symbolic remains to be seen. Okay, so many people were very hopeful after the election of Emmanuel Macron as uh, the French president and uh, even Macron said that he is like the Sun King now. Okay, many people to, uh, you know, were referring to him as the Sun King, like, you know, the new godfather of Europe and he is going to bring Europe back on the world stage. But as you can see here, uh, you know, the, uh, what, what this guy is saying is that, uh, you know, we will have to see uh, if the symbolic uh, outcomes really even, you know, get into reality. Okay, there are deep seated fundamental divisions in Europe over economic philosophies, foreign and security priorities and migration. Okay, look at this. There are deep seated fundamental divisions in Europe, deep seated fundamental divisions in Europe. So this is not like a one time thing. Okay, you one person cannot do this. This is a deep seated fundamental divisions in Europe over economic philosophies. Like, uh, as I said, you know, like, uh, Italy wanted to have like Corona bonds. Uh, but you know, many other frugal four like uh, Germany, Netherlands, uh, um, Austria and Finland did not wanted uh, Italy to, you know, go ahead with the Corona bonds. Okay foreign and security priorities and migration. Definitely foreign and security priorities are different for different countries and migration. Migration is definitely a very big issue that is driving many different countries. Many of the Southern European and Eastern European countries don't want to have immigrants into their countries like Hungary, Italy, then what Poland, uh, then, uh, you know, many other uh, Eastern European countries like uh, Czechoslovakia, Austria, right? So all these countries do not want uh, immigrants into their uh, into their land. But many of the Western European countries like uh, Germany, France, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, 
uh, then UK, all of them are just growing with immigrants. And why do they need immigrants? If you have seen my earlier videos, it's just because of, you know, economic, uh, it's, it's an economic uh, reason that they need immigrants, okay? As the fulcrum of global power shifts away from Europe and the Atlantic, and given the ongoing uncertainty about the future of US foreign policy and engagement in Europe, the European order looks increasingly fragile as do the institutions that embody that order okay look at this this is an uh, this is a very important article and this is written by two european guys okay look at this this is louis simon and ulrich speck okay as the fulcrum of global power shifts away from europe and the atlantic i have always said this right the future is asian right so this is this is exactly what this guy is saying the fulcrum of global power shifts away from europe and the atlantic why does he say and the Atlantic? Because Atlantic is what uh, he is referring to as Europe and North America, okay? And given the ongoing uncertainty about the future of US foreign policy, definitely there is uncertainty about US foreign policy. Uh, Trump just uh, pulled US out of the open skies policy. Then he has pulled US out of, uh, you know, uh, many other treaties. Like uh, he has said that NATO is brain dead, okay? Sorry, uh, Emmanuel Macron had said that NATO is brain dead. So it, there is definitely uncertainty about US foreign policy and engagement in Europe, okay? The European order looks increasingly fragile, okay? As do the institutions that embody that order. They are not mincing any words here. This is out in the open, okay? Beyond Europe power, beyond Euro Europe proper, conflict and geopolitical competition are back and globalization with its vision of benign harmonious global governance appears to be under threat. Definitely globalization appears to be under threat. I have a video on this channel where I say that there will be new world order after coronavirus, okay? Please check out that video to understand what, uh, you know, what I think about globalization after coronavirus. With the future becoming, becoming increasingly uncertain, there is a renewed interest in scenarios. How might the future look like if trends that are already visible today prevail and lead, lead to massive changes? What if events suddenly change the course of history as occurred in 1989? What is the purpose of European integration? What is it supposed to achieve or for that matter prevent from happening? What does a successful Europe look like and a failing one? Okay, so there are many questions because we, we are living in a very uncertain times right now. Okay, at the Elkanah Royal Institute's Brussels office, we have decided to contribute to the ongoing debate about Europe's long term future with a number of scenarios looking at Europe in 2030. Okay, our aim is to focus not only on uh, particular institutions such as the EU or NATO, but on the broader European geopolitical architecture, play, uh, paying special attention to the link between intra-European political relations and Europe's role in the world. That is where we want to put our mark and set this exercise apart from others. Our main focus is thus on the interaction between European states and their relations with great powers, primarily US, China and Russia. Okay, so this is what they are outlining in this paper. Okay. The broader question looming over our exercise is whether Europe will be a geopolitical subject or an object. Okay, so what they are trying to get here is that whether Europe will be a subject or an object. What they mean by that, I'll try to explain. Okay, that is an actor in its own right or a playground for great power competition. Okay, so whether Europe will be the subject, which is an actor in its own right, right? I mean, like, you know, Europe will be the driver. It will not be reactive. That's what they mean by that. Okay. Or a playground for great power competition. What, what does it mean by that is, you know, China and the US are, will be using Europe as like a playground as, uh, you know, many countries have used, uh, you know, different countries for proxy wars like in Korea or Vietnam or Afghanistan. So like uh, th that's what he's saying, like, you know, whether Europe will be like a proxy thing or whether it can drive its own future. It goes without say, saying that there is no way to address the question in black or white terms, but rather through a 50 shades of gray lens. Okay. So yeah, it, it's a gray matter. Okay. It's not very black and white. Here we sketch out four possible answers that rely on the views of four pol foreign policy experts on how the future might unfold. Okay. The b first contribution outlines the nightmare scenario. Okay. A divided free for all or for free for all Europe in which the continent falls prey to penetration from several external fact actors as well as to the reverberations of intra-european competition okay so this is the first scenario which says that it will be a nightmare scenario okay that's what they're calling it a divided free for all europe in which the continent falls prey to penetration from several external factors as well as to the reverberations of intra-european competition you know i think this scenario is the most likely because you know uh, as we saw in the current um, um, coronavirus madness, no country came to help Italy right now. Okay, even Spain, 
uh, did not see any help from the richer European countries like Germany or uh, you know uh, Netherlands or uh, France okay so I think this option is more likely what happens if Europe fails how does a Europe in which nation states have largely ceased to cooperate and the EU and NATO either wither away or become irrelevant look right I mean Emmanuel Macron has said that NATO is brain dead okay these were his exact words uh, uh, Trump has said uh, has warned many uh, NATO members that you know he is going to pull out of NATO if uh, you know the fund if they don't contribute their own fair, sh fair share okay Trump has also pulled out from uh, funding from WHO right so definitely EU and NATO will not be relevant in the near future okay I do not see a very uh, bright future for Europe because they have declining population they have uh, you know pretty racist countries to be very honest with you okay countries like Germany France Italy Spain they have have a huge arrogance about their language you know I've been to Germany and France uh, they cannot talk other than uh, I mean you cannot talk other than German or French in, in on their soil okay they will not answer you if you talk in English okay that's just how, how arrogant most of these countries are and to be honest they are pretty racist that's just a plain fact okay you know you come to this channel because you want the truth okay and my job is to give you the truth you know I will not sugarcoat any things that uh, that that needs to be said okay the second contribution takes a radically different point of departure a united europe in this scenario the eu succeeds in becoming both the key player in U european geopolitics as well as a significant force or pole in the world okay just look at the, you know i'm i'm willing to buy this argument but the facts are completely opposite okay like just look at the past 20 25 years of the european project okay since the berlin wall fell okay europe has been a failed project right from the start okay so as as was pointed out earlier uh, last 10 to 15 years there was a crisis after crisis in europe okay and when uh, nigel farage was leaving like when britain was leaving the european union uh, nigel farage has said that european union is not just uh, undemocratic it is anti-democratic okay just try to understand this it is not undemocratic it is anti-democratic for so european union is like a franco-german alliance and mostly german alliance where germany is like the big brother of everybody okay and germany has such a tight grip over every other country that it's really hard to even you know understand if any other country matters in europe other than germany okay so germany is equal to eu and eu is equal to germany that's what has happened right now so i don't see a very bright future for a united europe because europe is a fragmented uh, continent and these people have been fighting with each other for thousands of years okay thousands and thousands of years french and german have been fighting with each other, each other. italian spanish uh, you know then what dutch uh, danish uh, what polish they have been fighting with each other for thousands of years okay they have different languages they have you know significantly different cultures it's not very easy to unite europe okay and so when britain you know wanted to get out of europe i do understand why they wanted to get out okay many people just want to portray that europe uh, portray that britain is racist but i don't think that way okay because you know like uh, european union is a very bureaucratic and red tapist society and uh, you know it's very very slow to function it's not that business friendly as well okay um so I don't think the second uh, second scenario is more likely okay the third contribution is a rebirth of the west scenario okay so a rebirth of the west that's the third scenario in which the transatlantic framework remains the organizing factor of both European geopolitics and Europe's doings beyond Europe okay I will read this one more time the third contribution is a rebirth of the West scenario in which the transatlantic framework remains the organizing factor of both European geopolitics and Europe's doings beyond Europe okay so what what this means is that both North America and Europe are going to be relevant in the near future okay um, it outlines a future in which the US and the UK emerge again as the leaders of the United West and as the main focal points of European politics okay now you know I'm again I'm I'm willing to buy this argument okay I'm not saying that I'm entirely right but all I can say is that with the total disintegration of euro of US foreign policy do you do you really you know uh, honestly think that US can revive again okay Trump can say many times that make America great again but if the facts don't point to that direction you know 
I don't think any of this matters. Okay, so UK definitely is a very small country. Okay, it has Scotland is about to get out of the uh, Union, United Kingdom, uh, somehow. Okay, Scotland is out. When Scotland is out, then what? Scotland is almost like half of half of UK. Okay, the Northern Ireland and Ireland have been clashing with many for many many years. Okay, then you have Wales, right? So to be honest, uh, UK also is very very fragmented. US in itself is extremely divided. Okay, like look at the 2020 election right now. You know, no matter who wins in the 2020 election, it is going to be almost like a, to be like like the nightmare. Okay, there's no other word to describe what will happen in the US in 2020 election. Okay, so I don't think any of this uh, is even plausible. US and UK to emerge again as leaders of the United West is just impossible. Okay, the future is Asian, and that's why many of the uh, you know co companies are also trying to invest more and more into Asia. Okay, US and UK have very low growth rates as well. Okay, so I don't I don't think this this kind of scenario is that likely. The fourth and final contribution presents a strong China scenario in which the mechanics of Chinese penetration in Europe are unpacked. Okay. I think this can be more likely. Okay, this uh, you know I think first and the fourth scenarios are more likely. Okay, I am not a pessimist, but I am just a realist. Okay, I am really just trying to give you a good picture and an honest picture of what I think can happen in Europe. The fourth and final contribution presents a strong China scenario. Look at China right now. You know nobody expected China to become the dominant economy in the world by 2020. Okay, nobody expected that. If you ask somebody in the year 2000, you know, they would have laughed at you. But look at China right now. Okay, China has had almost 10% growth year on year for the past 20, 25 years. And definitely the future is going to be Asian. Okay, right now, Trump talks more about China than about any other country in the entire world. There is a video where Trump is just talking about China all the time. Okay, so look at that video and you will understand why China is so important in today's world. I have made a video on my channel where I say, you know, how China owns America. Okay, go and watch that video and you will understand why I think uh, the future is Asian and why China is so important on the world stage. Okay, so the fourth and final contribution presents a strong China scenario in which the mechanics of Chinese penetration in Europe are unpacked. So definitely China is going to, you know, uh, take control of the, uh, you know, weaker countries in Europe. Okay. I made also a video about Belt and Road Initiative, which is like the One Belt, One Road uh, project of China. You can also check that video out. It is on my channel. Okay. So I think, uh, you know, China is definitely going to leverage these kind of uh, fractures in the European Union and try to bring all the Eastern European countries to its side. Mostly Southern European countries are also on its side. You know, when uh, Italy was in trouble due to coronavirus pandemic, China sent its, uh, you know, uh, PPE equipment and ventilators to Italy. So, you know, Italy is more indebted to China right now than it is to European Union. Just imagine this, okay? <laughs> country like Italy, which is a part of the European Union, is now more in favor of China than it is in favor of the European Union. So definitely, I think the fourth scenario is more likely. Okay, so the first scenario is saying that it will it will be a divided free for all Europe. I think that is also more likely. And the fourth scenario is also more likely, where you know we have a strong China in which the mechanics of Chinese penetration in Europe are unpacked. Okay, developing the scenario implies taking some risks. The future that might be. Uh, can look very different from all four scenarios presented here. But we believe that thinking about scenarios is nevertheless uh, of key importance to policy makers, experts and the wider public. Not because they predict with scientific rigor what is going to happen, but because they make it easier to discuss expectations and to bring into the open the many implicit assumptions about the future on which our political discourse is built. Okay, The credibility of scenario-based exercises depends uh, not so much on the methodology, but rather on the ability of researchers to identify major trends, connect those trends with each other and use their imagination and creativity to go beyond conventional images about the future okay so as i said you know just look at the trends okay you know nobody can predict the future i understand that i am not a fortune teller i don't have a crystal ball with me but all i can say is that based on the trends that have been happening in the world okay i can say that definitely the first and fourth uh, scenarios are more likely okay uh, so I will not go through any more uh, uh, statements in this article, but uh, all I can say is that, uh, you know, European Union is a failed project and it has been a failed project for long, long time. You know, many people have pointed out that, you know, can Europe even survive the next uh, two to three years? I mean, forget about 10 years. Okay. Many people uh, are saying that, uh, you know, European Union is just a patchwork of a project. Okay. They are just trying to... Uh, 
you know uh, get it get it through somehow by you know patching it with different things okay so i think uh, you know european union might uh, just be uh, collapsing in the near future okay and to be honest with you many countries in europe are better off by not being in the union then they are by being in the union that is my honest opinion and just that is just my individual opinion okay that what i'm saying again okay, i will say it one more time european union is a failed project and many countries in the union are better not being in the union then they are by being in the union okay so this was my analysis of what europe will look like by 2030 if you liked my analysis of this article or if you dislike my analysis of this article please let me know in the comments and we can have a fair and square discussion i am open to different uh, views and comments and statements okay so uh, we can have a very good discussion in the comments if you want to so uh, and before you know before i end this video uh, hit that subscribe button and also hit that like share and comment uh, button so that you know you can uh, uh, get more of these kind of awesome videos with detailed analysis from my side of the world Thank you have a good day bye bye